All right, we're going to bring to the stage the one and only Mr. Mitchell Ward, Pamela Ward, MW Logistics. Give it up. Give a big round of applause. Let them hear it. Let's go. Freight Fest 23. We active. Come on. Let's go, y'all. Get up. Get up. Can everyone hear me out there? Yeah. Are we good? I can tell you one thing, this show will be double the size next year. I'm gonna do everything in my power yeah. with Ramel to bring in other kind of speakers and people that are, are huge entrepreneurs and business owners of major corporations. We are gonna grow this thing and watch him be very successful because when I started the business, there was nothing like this. This is very special uh, to have a business like this. So we're very excited to be here and me and my wife would like to thank uh, him for inviting us. I tell people, the number one decision you'll make in your life, some people say it's God, some people say it's uh, college, what college you pay, and I tell them, no, the, the, the number one decision you'll make in your life is the person you choose to stand by your side. Yeah. And for those who don't believe that, pick the wrong one, you will see. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get started. Okay, thank you, honey. Okay, uh, again, I reiterate thank you to Trek and Hustle for having us here at Freight Fest. We're very excited to be here and share the journey that I will say Mitchell went through with MW Logistics. Um, I'm Pam Wills Ward, his spouse. Um, I joined the company about two and a half years ago. MW Logistics is a Dallas based, privately family held company. We focused on third, uh, third party logistics, we have no assets. All of everything we do is technology and people connecting, helping our customers connect the movement of their freight. Um, when I joined about two and a half years ago, um, the reason I joined is kind of a kind of a funny story, kind of not. Um, I had my own executive career, talent management for a global event company, handled a lot of talent-focused strategies in different countries in the U.S project management, if there was a project or system or something that was broke, I was the one given to fix it, had a great career there, was able to early retire, thinking I was gonna get my zen on at home with our children who are getting up in age in high school. And I've always looked at the financials, so ladies, if you are with your husbands in business or even elsewhere, always look at the financials and know the business from the side. Um, and I would help do talent-focused consulting with him from time to time. So, had more time on my hands, was helping him hire some folks, the CFO and some others, and I said, hey, have you ever decided to grow the business? Why not? There's no wrong answer. We're doing well. Or you may want to grow it. Again, it's kind of like our local donut shop that we like. They're a great family company. He goes, I like it. Our schedule fits. It gives us all we need. He listened, as he always does. I can't tell what he took or didn't take. <laughs> About two weeks later, he comes home and he says, you know, I was thinking about what we were talking about. And I think all of a sudden the, the kind of introduction changed. We could do it. And I was like, who's we? <laughs> this is for you. So anyway, he says, you need to come into MW Logistics and do what you've done for someone else for all these years and we can make it happen together. So here I am. So with that, um, we thought today we'd take the time and walk you through the journey of Mitchell in the transportation industry. I think he said, uh, like he always says at the last minute sometimes, Pam, I'm going to ask you some questions at the end, but that's okay. Um, and so you can hear the life of an entrepreneur. I know many of you in the audience are entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. You're looking to do something for yourselves and your families to make a difference and to be successful. So hopefully something you hear, we're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, something will help you along your own individual business journey. So Mitchell, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, have a seat. <laughs> so Mitchell, um, before MW Logistics, you had two, you had two companies. Um, one was Transportation Unlimited where he had 100 trucks and I think 150 trailers-ish. Correct. And um, it came, you were about 25-ish, is right before we got married? 20, 25. Okay, 25-ish. Um, and then from there, you had another company called MW Transportation, I believe it was called, or MW something. Transportation. Transportation. Okay. Those two ventures didn't go so well. You, uh, you had a couple of bankruptcies, I'd hate to say, I, I and have, I a had couple three of things. Okay. I had to go into bankrupting both of those companies 
and uh, filed in one personal bankruptcy. Uh, the good thing about that, I was young and I had some mentors when that happened to me that drug me through that jungle of business. Because when I first heard that I was going to have to file for bankruptcy, I cried like I was just crying because I looked at it as not only had I failed and I'd you know, been a pretty successful athlete and uh, pretty successful in my life to, to, to fail, really for the first time of having failure, just really broke me up. And I'd asked the question, I told my lawyers, I said, look here, let me tell you what I'm gonna do. I said, I wanna bring all the banks in here. I said, I wanna set them down in the room and I want to tell them I'm gonna have a strategy of paying them off. And my lawyer told me, said, let me tell you something, that ain't gonna work. You know, you're so far in the hole, you got three bankers, all of them got egos, and as soon as you tell them that, they're gonna, they're gonna start biting each other's throat. I said, well, you know what? You guys will work for me, you're my lawyers, this is what we're gonna do. So we bought them in the conference room, we set them down, and the lawyer said, we got one deal. We wanna fill out 100% of the bankruptcy paper, and we wanna have somebody sitting in the clerk's office while you have this meeting. I said, well, okay. So I got in there and I'll never forget it. I told him, I said, look, it was Bank One, Nation's Bank, and I can't remember who they were back, there was another one. And I said, guys, I, you know, I got a lot of debt here and I can't pay you all, but if you allow me to just keep doing what I'm doing, I'm gonna pay each one of you a little of this money back. I said, I'm gonna pay you this amount of money, I'm gonna pay you this amount of money, I'm gonna pay you this amount of money. And they both looked at each other and said, no, if you pay him, you better pay me. And the other one said, well, yeah, and if you pay them, you better pay me. And my, my lawyer looked at me and I nodded at him. He made the call to his, uh, he said, can I step out guys? To the, to the guy and said, file the paperwork. Walked back in the room, he said, you can tell him. I said, guys, I just now filed for chapter seven, bankruptcy. And they're like, whoa, 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 too late because we couldn't work it out. Uh, from every bankruptcy that I filed, put me on this stage today. Because in business, a lot of times you think that it's you need to know what to do. In business, you need to know what not to do and become an expert at what not to do in your business so you can be successful. And that's where I started to become who I am today, what not to do and understanding the banks and how they look at you and that sort of thing. So that was a, that was a tough pill for me to swallow. Uh, I understood uh, the debt to equity. I understood what EBITDA meant to them. I understood about the balance sheet. Nobody talked to me at 25 about a balance sheet, nobody. And you know why? Because I didn't have any family members who were successful in business, so nobody could tell me. So I was out there learning on my own. I was getting the best college degree I could out there in this real world. And so I stress to all of you, make sure you focus on your balance sheet because that tells banks that you're capable of paying them back. So if you don't focus on that balance sheet, no matter who you're, black, green, white, yellow, uh, orange, they're not gonna loan you money. So you had learning lessons along the way. So next bankruptcy, your, that next venture, and I always told Mitchell, knowing him for as long as I had before, he could never work for anybody, but I'm like, you gotta get a job, you gotta do something. <laughs> So with that is like, you know, his mind started whirling and next thing I know, he says, I'm gonna start a logistics company. And so Mitchell, tell the audience a little bit about how you shifted and what your, I, what your process was to come up with that next thing where you thought you could make an impact and really be successful in business. When I started to get the mentors around the marketplace to really understand how they do business, I started to find out that the big companies out there from Schneider to Hunt to all of these companies have empty trucks every day. And back then, when I was starting out, C.H. Robinson, old grandpa, as I call him, was doing very well what we call the broker business. So I looked at C.H. Robinson, went and met the CEO, I can't think of his name then, and uh, I looked around and talked about how they did things. And from there, I created MW Logistics. So what I have today. I said, why do I have to buy all these trucks? Why do I have to have all this debt? Why do I have to have you know, all these recurring payments and you know, all this stuff that, that an asset's gonna have you, the liability, the insurance. Because once you get that truck, you have to get a mechanic, and then you have to get for tires, and you gotta get for brakes, and it's just, a, you know, safety and all of that. I said, why do I have to have that when C.H. Robinson is four or five billion dollars back then doing that and not having really any assets, using everybody else's assets in the marketplace to be successful. And that made me say, that's what I'm gonna do. Now, here's the challenge. There are certain customers 
that uh, are going to say, if you don't have assets, they don't want to do business with you. Guess what? That's not your customer. That's not your customer. Okay. You've been told a lot of things that'll make you successful in business ever since you was a little kid. Your mama's told you, play with those who want to play with you. You know, play with those who want to play with you. Don't try to convince that fool who don't want to play with you uh, to play with you. Making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business. Today, I stopped by my friends over at Fleet Drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company. And it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post-crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard. And the dashboard's the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard, and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company, and vehicle level. It's one-stop shop for all your compliance needs. And that's what I don't do. And, and I am a, my wife will tell me, she says, I'm always at a 10. And I tell people, when I can't be who I am, where I am, I change my damn where. Okay. When you cannot be who you are, where you are, change your where. Because at the end of the day, you are who you are. God's blessed every one of you here with a talent. Everybody who's born has a talent, has a gift. Some of us use them, some of us don't. The ones who use them is, is the ones who be successful. The most powerful thing you're going to have is your Rolodex. We don't have Rolodexes anymore, honey. Well, it's called content. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, again. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll, say, I'll say your iPhone. The most powerful thing you can have your is directory, your iPhone. Your directory. Uh, but my wife will tell you, I'm always on the phone with somebody. I'm always going to something to try to learn. I'm always on fishing, hunting trips, uh, trying to be with other people. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get mentored by Martin Transport. Randy Martin personally took me up under his wing. Um, and I never looked back. And when I saw a company like Martin, they're publicly traded. And they taught us basically how to publicly traded companies are the best companies to look at because you can look at what they're doing. You can see everything they're doing. And you can extrapolate that and how do you do it in a private business? And Randy just allowed me to be a part of the strategic meetings, be a part of uh, some of the board meetings, it allowed me to be look up under the hood of that organization. When I saw a company making $12 million a quarter and has never, never lost money, I don't care what the market is, what the industry says, they don't lose money. Doesn't happen. You can look them up, they're publicly traded. They're considered one of the best out there in the marketplace. So we got that same culture at our organization. We don't lose money just don't happen. There's customers. We focus on trying to get, and we're, we're, we're still a long way from there, no customer being more than 4% of our business. Why? Because I may want to fire that customer. And if I want to fire them and walk away, I don't want them to hurt me. So, so, so Mitchell, you're talking about customers and, you know, MW Logistics is blessed to have what I call, I used to call them divas, that's not a good thing. I call them the blue chip now. They have a lot of expectations on us. Um, how do you, I've heard someone in, someone in the hall had asked me, how do you go about getting these larger customers? We know they have DEI initiatives. We know that they're saying they want to do business, but how do you actually get in the door and, or find out about these opportunities? How you find out about the opportunities is every customer you have is your best customer. 
And that customer knows somebody else across that market space, across that supply chain that they can introduce you to. The only way they're going to introduce you to those people, if you've been doing a good job. Every Tuesday, everybody in my office know I'm looking at every scorecard for every customer every week, no matter where I'm on the road or whatever. What is our scorecard? If you want to get a raise, bonus, or promotion, it's all about the overall scorecard. If you don't have a scorecard where you're managing the business that we have for those customers, don't come to my office and ask for no raise. It's going to be an easy conversation. No. <laughs> if you, we are very eccentric about that scorecard. I have one of our employees we saw here, and she'll tell you, I'm going to look at that scorecard, and you know, the higher you're in the tree, the more you're, gonna, you're probably going to deal with me on a daily basis. The people that are out there just doing the work, there's no reason to go out there and, and fuss at them and scream at them and kill that culture on your floor. No, I'm going to talk to those directors level people that are highly paid and compensated that's supposed to be getting this job done because it's their job to get the job done. We have a saying, I will not have your job and your salary and pay you for something that, I, that, that you're supposed to do that I, I have to do. Understanding what you do. I want to ask somebody something. This is a hundred dollar bill. Yes, sir. How many people out there would, if I said, I'm going to give you this hundred dollar bill, take this hundred dollar bill. Raise your hands. <coughs> okay. If I, if I folded this hundred dollar bill, hold on. If I folded this hundred dollar bill, would you still want it? Yes. If I crumpled it up, would you still take it? Yes. Let me tell you why he took that $100 bill. No matter how I folded it, no matter how I crumpled it up, it never changed its value. Understand and know your value. And when you know your value, you can walk in any conference room, any room, be confident in what you are and know what you can do. We looked at probably four acquisitions this uh, summer, honey. Mm -hmm. Four acquisitions, because my wife did, how many acquisitions were you a part of that you Oh, led? I don't know, it's over years. <laughs> over years and so I had somebody who understood what M&A looks like we understood what we were going into because the hardest thing to marry up when you start to do that acquisitions is the culture and the technology because my wife is every day every week trying to turn us into a technology company that moves freight we are very very we spend a lot of money in technology why because that's the only thing that I think is going to improve work-life balance. If a person can go in their office and get their job done between 8 and 5 and go home and see their family, that's where it is. And if they got to get an answer, they don't have to walk around with a laptop. They can get it right off their phone and keep doing the business if they need to do the business. In so, addition, it allows you to be scalable. So overnight in our accounting department, we turned on one aspect. We, we at first, when I first came in, the mailbox was full every day with paper. I'm like, who is still taking paper this day and age? It was 2021. All these paper, I was like, there, there's automation out there. So they, we, before, right before I started, you'd already signed a contract for McLeod, remember? Mm -hmm. And that's who we use as our TMS. McLeod is our TMS that we use. And we love McLeod because we thought at that time it was the best TMS on the market after doing the hard review of them. In our accounting department, I have to, my wife came in and took that over. We don't write paper checks. Not one, ever. Ever. We don't even have a, I don't even know what a paper check looked like. We don't check, but. Everything we do is ACH. <laughs> but overnight, remember, we did the first aspect and they're like, we can't do this. It won't work. It did work. We turned on one aspect of our billing. We went to 92% automation overnight. I didn't, then told him, guess what? Accounting can now scale to whatever growth strategy we put into place. We have to be able to execute in all of our departments, all that new business we said we were going to grow and get. So as you look at technology, not saying you have to do exactly what that system has, but how can you really scale it to fit what you need to get done? Don't put old bad habits in. It's a great time to review and look at your current processes, how you're doing them, where are the pain points. Mm -hmm. Many times technology can assist you with that. And the goal is not to replace people. It's to continue to grow with that talent sheet that already knows the business, knows you, knows your culture, and you like them, I'm assuming, so they can stay and continue to grow and do more meaningful work. So that's a good thing. That's a definite good thing. And that was the basics of our foundation of growth was looking at every process throughout the company and figuring out, is it right for us? Is it working? What are our pain points? But it was also the unification of all departments that we have to say, 
one department can't have all the wins. There's gonna be a little bit of give and take in this whole process so we can all have a successful end. So we're still going through that. It's a constant evolvement, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's a good one. You have to, I, I, I brag about our, our technology because like I said, I think we're at 93% now, 100% of our bills are, are non-touch. We don't touch mm -hmm. them. Collections, we don't have a collection problem. We will never have a collection problem at MW Logistics. I can guarantee you that. You don't pay me, you will see me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. I guarantee you that. There is, you know, and that's about really vetting the customers that you do business with and how they do business. And if you're, once you are even a day late, it automatically sends that person out an email saying, hey, you're, you're a day late on this receivable, here's where it is. After the second day, it sends you another email. Then it starts escalating all the way up to the CEO. How do you find these numbers? Zoom info. <laughs> Zoom info is one of the best tools out there. You can find cell phone numbers, you can find customers, you can find everything you need to do off of Zoom info. And if not, I have enough relationships in the family with some of these big guys, they're gonna know somebody. They're like, hey Mitch, I know you, don't tell them, I don't tell them I gave you the number, just tell them you found it somewhere, da, da, da. So those things are so important. We close our books in three days. If my financials aren't closed in three days, they'll tell you, I start fidgeting, start walking around, you know, I, 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 you know because I wanna know where we're at. I don't wanna be looking in the rear view mirror, talking about, we looked at a company and uh, they said, yeah, we closed our book in 15 days. And I whispered to my wife, I said, oh, y'all be fine. <laughs> you can't do that, you're running your business. Cash is important. I got a $4 million line of credit and I don't wanna use all of it. I'm always trying to push it down, where we're at. I get a checkbook in the morning, of what we got in the bank, where our line of credit is, I get a checkbook in the afternoon to see where it's changed. The employee that's most likely to steal from you is this one that's been with you the longest. You need to know that because they know how you act. They know how the business runs and you kind of take your eye off of them and then you allow them to do something and just guess what? They start you know, doing things they shouldn't do. Audits are important. Here, how big or how small? We're now with Moss Adams. Uh, we've been with them for the last, what, three years, honey? Yes. Three years. We usually uh, take an account, we were with, with Grant Thornton before that. In three years, we'll put it out to bid and we'll look at some other companies just to keep us fresh in what's going on out there. Audits are important because when you go to the bank, if you, if you have the right organization auditing your financials and telling people where you are, it's a lot easier to get a bank loan. They're not gonna question those, those companies that are out there like that, that have already have a reputation of somewhat being successful. Audits are your friend, because if one of you drop dead and die, your husband or your wife has something they can go and say, well, this is the evaluation of the business, it's what I know. Otherwise, you're going through a whole bunch of paperwork trying to figure out you know, what's going on with that organization. It's important that you share stuff with your spouse or your um, um, wife or husband because they need to know. Now, there's certain things, you know, I told my kids one time, I said, look here. Because my wife says, well, I looked in the garage and you bought. I said, yeah. She said, what, what did that thing cost? I said, well, it cost this. I looked at my kids and said, it didn't cost this. So if I die, I don't have your mama set up for what I told her. Because otherwise, you're going to be upside down. But it's very important that you know everything about that business. Because when disruption happens or something happens, it's very, very uh, important that you know. I have a, a son that that is part in the business and going to school full time. Uh, and he's learning a lot. And I put him in, you know, we put him in there. He started out uh, in uh, uh, scheduling and now he's in inside sales and he'll take the whole gamut. Because we've already talked about it with him. Will you pass this on to you? Probably not. One of our goals is to create a board of directors and if you want to sit on the board of that board of directors and manage from there, like Alice Walden do Walmart, then that's probably the model we're going to take. There's better operators than your kids. There's better operators than people in your family. Your job as a CEO of that company is find the best operator you can and put them in position and allow you to be successful. Okay, Mitchell, that caveats into a question I had. We talked about this last night after the dinner. Um, you're, as a younger entrepreneur, earlier in the years of MW Logistics, 
you had to grow. As the CEO and the owner, there's other things you have you had to do to grow the business. You couldn't wear 20 hats all the time and be successful mm -hmm. and grow. So as you hired individuals, how did you trust that they were doing the correct thing? You know, reporting, you had great conversations of metrics and understanding. Tell a little bit about that because that seems to be a struggle for some. Uh, you know, how do you let go of the reins and still be comfortable to let that run and you feel comfortable things are still going in a positive direction? Two things, and, I, and we finally got here, is where we, we really don't hire a lot of retreads. What do you see, what is a retread? Somebody who's been at the industry somewhere a long time and they think they know everything about what to do, okay? So we will look at some time, we, are, we got a very uh, heavy recruiting program I think we've hired out of Texas Tech. We got mm -hmm. uh, three people there. We've hired out of Baylor. North we got a, a process person there, and we've hired out of Texas A&M. We just got another guy in. So we are always for us in our organization. We don't need a lot of them. We just need the right ones. We need the right ones that are coachable. One thing that I was told when I was playing professional football was Coach Ernie Stockner came in and said, "Guess what office never closed in football." And we said, what, coach? He said, the recruiting office. It don't ever close in football. So you cannot stop recruiting. You have to find those right people. You got to keep your hook in the water because you never know when that talent that is going to leave somewhere or is been in the industry less than three years and is still learning is going to throw that hook. They're going to bite that hook. And you're not, if you don't have your hook in the water, that talent has no way to find you. I'm very active on social media, very active on uh, Facebook. I wasn't before. I'm very active on uh, uh, LinkedIn about what we do and we just keep engaging the talent. So when people do look at us and they say, well, you know what, let me check out this company. They can really tell themselves a story because when you are the only person doing everything, working in your business and not on your business, you're going to have a challenge. So Mitchell, um, we did not discuss this question. So I'm gonna throw this one at you. Um, many small companies start in their heavily they employ their, their family, or they feel they have to employ their family. Any thoughts on that you'd like to share with the audience? You only hire your family if they're talented. You only hire your family if they're talented. If they can really move the needle in your organization, you hire your family. Because let me tell you something, first time, you know the first employee I fired when I had trucks was my father. <laughs> And me and my mom didn't talk for almost six months. She'll tell you, I fired my daddy. This is a business, and you have to look at it like a business. You have to, when you're sitting in that seat, you have to make decisions that's going to affect people that you like. But what's better for the business? So when you want to wear that leadership hat, you're in a tough situation because you're going to be making decisions. These people got you know, house notes and, and car notes and stuff like that that you're going to have to make decisions on. And sometimes they're not going to be very popular. But you look at the winners. Nick Saban, he don't care. You know, you have to make those decisions. And so when you look at that, I was hiring mostly by my gut when I was first started. When my wife came into the organization, she said, well, well this person here, you hire, well, Show me their basis and all that. I said, I feel good about it. I feel good. <laughs> she said, but what's your basis? I feel good. Well, how do I feel good about them? I don't know. Because men and women are different. Let me tell you how. How many times, and, I, and I'm going to talk to the men on this one. Is this an approved story? Yeah, this is a good story. Okay. It's appropriate. It's, it's appropriate. <laughs> how many times, have men, you've been with your wife, and she meet one of your friends, and she said, I don't like him. <laughs> and the first thing you say as a man is, well, you don't like him. She said, I don't know, but I just don't like him. I got a feeling. <laughs> and then you're sitting there, you're upset because you're like, well, but, but, but honey, what is it that you don't, I, I just, I'm just telling you, I, just give, me, give me about two years, I'll tell you, but I don't like him. <laughs> it will prove itself is what I tell and you. And for guys, <laughs> we're so right there. If I don't like you, I don't like because you wear that blue jacket or that green jacket. I can tell you why I don't like somebody. But for them, that's not how they work. That's not how, you know, that women look at it. And usually, they, what they're telling you, they're right. When my wife came into my organization, she did an evaluation just like she would, like she was buying the company. And she came in there, 
And she told me, I said, well, honey, what did you think? You met all the people? You, you, you. She bought every employee in one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, what did you think? Now, we've been in business 20 years at that time. She said, 90% of them are going to have to go if you want to grow. I said, what the hell are you going to call my baby ugly? <laughs> she just called my baby mud ugly. <laughs> now, you got to realize we're in business. We're debt free. We're doing good. But she said, if you want to go from here to here, the people you have can't get you there. And she implemented a whole new system, a whole new, we started testing people, we started seeing, you know, we tested our employees in house, we saw the ones we really liked and was doing a great job by the matrix. Uh, and, 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 and we started really looking at it. We have fun at office. If you're the last person, uh, Victoria said, ask her, and you're not doing well, you got a big picture of you on, the, on a 72 inch screen, it's a donkey on it, because you're a donkey. Because you can't take a donkey and put him in the Kentucky Derby and win. So you have to have a, uh, and that was her background of talent acquisition, what you need in pers certain positions on talent. And where can that talent acquisition get you? And once you know where they can get you, you say, okay, when they get here, we've got to reevaluate that person. Our employees are evaluated every month, written evaluation. Every, every director is in charge of giving us uh, a sheet one one. of how they evaluated that employee. We're not going to get ready to fire somebody or terminate somebody. And you say, well, yeah, they've been doing this for three months. And the person looks at you, well, you hadn't told me anything. So you make them sit down and write it down and let that employee know how they can improve. Otherwise, you just got a bunch of foolishness. So Mitchell, talk a little bit about um, what I said coming in about the talent and things like that. Um, what I have seen, and I think what you experienced is, Every year or two, you have to evaluate and determine, are you on track? Are you doing the right things to stay relevant, to get ahead in this industry? Um, I know since I've been on two and a half years, I've seen a total shift in the, the progressive nature of technology, automation, um, accountability with scorecards, things of that nature. So when you look ahead um, at companies that are starting up or starting into a new venture, what advice would you give them to, to do? One thing that, that you are talk yourself in that you can't afford, that you must afford if you want to be successful. When you start to grow that talent pool, you have to look at why am I bringing these people in? What is their job going to do? And how is that going to help our business grow? Uh, we went after two, um, uh, what is it, price and analysts. Mm -hmm. And those two price and analysts, all they do is all our RFPs that come in. So what does that do? That person, they've been with us, what, two years now almost? Mm -hmm. Two years. Two years. So they've been doing the same pricing for those same customers and understand how the price to market, understand and looking at the market. We got all the tools from them to look at that market. So they get better at it. So our winning ratio keeps going up when, we, when we're, we're winning. We win business every day, every week from somebody, many bids, whatever. But we had to get those pricing analysts. Then we had to go get data analysts. I ain't know what the data analysts were They're back there. <laughs> And those data analysts, what they do, we had one from uh, Baylor uh, and uh, TCU that is very talented. And what we did there was we wanted to know what our business is doing. We needed to build Power BIs. They had to have Python experience. They had to have Taboo, Tabo, Tableau, whatever it's called. Experience. They had to have Power BI. They had to have all those skills or we wouldn't hire them. And then we test them to make sure how they did. You have to be excellent in Excel to be in that department over there. If you don't grade it excellent, you won't, you won't make it. Because so there's a lot of moving the spreadsheets you have to move to tell you what your business is doing, tell you how to price your business, and tell you how to be successful. You're making me nervous, Stan. You're supposed to be sitting with me. <laughs> um, something I want you to cover, though, is the business aspect. You talk a lot about talent, the traits a person has. But what about the business? I think when we made the decision to grow MW Logistics, it's kind of like, what is our plan? What, what do we need to focus on? We did our own SWOT analysis. I know from my perspective what I thought the strengths and weaknesses were, but that's a, I'll just say that's a constant thing I think any business needs to do. You need to have your own mission plan, your culture of your business. I remember a first exercise I did with the leaders and employees, I did them separate groups. If you tell someone you work for this company, what do you want it to be known for? And I did it from different angles, from the people they work with, from the experience of the service they received. 
because these are all the things you want to be, hey, this is great. You want to work for a winning team. Outline that for your own selves, for your own businesses, and look at that and say, okay, right, this is my path. This is what I want to be known for. This is what I want employees to, to the employees that are good and I want to stay. This is how I want them to feel when they're at work. That translates into your interactions with your customer. It translates into your marketing plan. It translates into the experience and the conversations with your customers and how they're going to see you and how they're going to get the great business from you. Um, it's all selling points along the way. So we did those kind of things. Um, we also, you, as you grow, one more thing. You, you see the balance. <laughs> yeah. You see the balance. Yeah. I let her do what she does and she's very good at it and I don't touch it. You may, even if I don't agree with her, I say, honey, that's you. But I touch yours. Yes, so, <laughs> I do touch this. I, I delve over here. I'm delving in it now. Um, <laughs> you have to, because you have to say, hey, you got to be open to that back and forth. Um, what was I going to say? You made me forget when you jumped in. <laughs> well, here's what I want to, there's so much more we can talk about. Yeah, but, questions. Uh, we're down to about 11 minutes, and I know there's people out there who may have questions for me that may help them and help their business. But before we get to that, I came in the room earlier and I've taped a $100 bill up under one of these chairs. So if you check up under your chair and there's a $100 bill, it's yours. You say, what's the purpose of, of that? Do I have a winner? Uh-oh, check the one next to it's, you. It's there. <laughs> yeah. It's there. Mitchell, where'd you put it? All right, there she is. There he is, right there. And the reason for me putting that $100 bill up on the table, sometimes being in the right place, you can be lucky. It's not all about talent sometimes. Being in the right place at the right time, you can be lucky. So did you do anything wrong out there? No, that person just sit in the right chair at the right time and was pretty well lucky. That's how life works sometimes. And be ready when that opportunity be presents ready. itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have any questions, raise your hand and uh, let us take some questions from you. Do I see anybody? I yes, sir. Right here. I just want to say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mike, so everybody can hear you. <laughs> State your name and your question, please, sir. How you doing? My name is Bobby Williams. I'm from New York. <clears throat> and I just wanted to say that this was the greatest transformation of information that I've received. I've been to plenty of conferences, seminars, webinars over the last 10, 15 years. This presentation right here by you guys, I mean, this whole front row, we all were, I mean, we all were just like mind blow. I was even watching, I mean, everybody was just taken back. So I just want to say, Thank you. I, oh, I thank thank you. you. I mean, incredible, incredible. A, a pleasure, pleasure. I love that. I love that. Any other questions, questions or? Questions. Right back See your hand over here. State your name and ask your question. Sheree Bondurant, um, the logistics here of Columbus, Ohio. So my question is, how do you all keep the balance of relationship and growing a business because sometimes the stressors of a relationship and the stressors of business can become, mm -hmm. you know, overwhelming at times. Like, so how do you all, like, what are some of the strategies you have? Like you work with a person all day long, you gotta go home and look at them all night long too. Ooh, true. Like how you do that? <laughs> I can Let tell you, I, 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 I wanna answer that first. <laughs> I can tell you this, that at the time my wife walked in the office, we got our first automated car. And what I mean by there, some days we get in the car, I'm looking at the left window, she's looking at the right window, the car just going down the road. And then we get to where we're going to get to, she get out, I get out, we, get, we go out and we speak, we get back in, we don't speak. It's going to have some of those days when you work yeah. with your wife. Because wives think they're always right. We are, <laughs> use the wrong verb, we are. <laughs> and, and when I want to pull the big Trump card, I always have to tell her, the MW Trump on the door stands for Mitchell Ward, not Miss Ward, okay? <laughs> Come on now. And it's funny because customers say it does stand for Miss Ward. So, okay, yeah. so I made my point. They go, I want um, to talk to your wife. Your, to your question, um, it's hard. I have a, a, a young lady um, that I'm in the Lynx chapter with, and we kind of had a powwow, and she talked to me about it a bit. You know, it's like you said, some days are great. Other days, it's a struggle. We'll, we'll go to our corners and have to agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, we're grounded, and we want success. 
And I think that's what it comes down to. We had to really early on find our balance. We have very different leadership styles and very different approaches to business. My husband loves to go squirrel on me, I like to tell him, that shiny penny. Squirrel, I remember squirrel. when I came in, my first phrase was, all business is not good business. You have to align it to where you are trying to go. And we had agreed the focus was to grow strategically with, with what we do, non-asset based 3PL, doing the best business for our customers that we could and diversify clients. And he comes in like a month later, I wanna buy this and da, da, da. I'm like, that has nothing to do with what we talked about. You have gone squirrel on something that does not apply and we're gonna derail the plan. We didn't even have talent to execute it. So to, to all that to say is you gotta have an open dialogue and keep the conversation, just go in it realistically. You're gonna agree to disagree some and, days. And, and all of us understand what a squirrel is. You see the squirrel grow for cheaper. Just keeps moving around. That's him. Now, the thing is, I've dated, I dated my wife 12 years before we got married. I want well, to make sure I was to right. What, it, it, there's a lot of stuff in between the 12 years, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> and we've been married now 25. Did you get it right? 25? Yep, that's right. That's right. 25, yeah. I had to think of I, He's better on dates than I am, so I'm yes. like, da, 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 yeah. And we have three wonderful kids. Uh, we have how many? Three. I thought you said two. I was like, three? Three. <laughs> And uh, we're very proud of them. One is uh, uh, here with us uh, in Dallas going to college. The other one's in Northwestern in Chicago uh, going to college. And we have one that's be very talented that's a junior in high school. So uh, they get a lot from me. They see me, they just run the other way, like, oh, here we come with some motivation, man. He's gonna come in there, man. No, no, the, the best thing is though, now that we work together, um, to get me getting the phone calls when I'm at the office, like, why are you at the office and dad is at home? That he hates that. <laughs> it's like, what is dad doing? So, um, but you can work it out with the spouse, it works out well. Any other questions? Yeah. We are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, Factor is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is Factor important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company, or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. Yep, right over here. Uh -huh. How are you doing? Al Howard, uh, Stone Logistics out of uh, Orlando, Florida. Uh, you mentioned um, your, your, your 3PL non-asset base, but you also talked about Martin Transport or transportation. Is that mm -hmm. a particular relationship that you really leaned on in your business model, or is it, can you just give a little bit more insight on that? I'll give you the real insight on that. At the time that I wanted to go into logistics, I had wanted to find one thing that I'm very good at, and I, and I like to say this, and that's called partnerships. Every partner that I've ever had has pretty well became a millionaire. And I brag about that because it's not hard. It's hard to do a partnership. Whenever I do a partnership, we already know who our lawyer is going to be. And we already know who our litigator is going to be. We never put a deal together without a lawyer and a litigator in the room at the same time because the, our deal lawyer is going to write the deal points. The litigator is going to litigate it if it goes bad. That's one thing you need to look at. A lawyer that can do everything, pretty scary. Some lawyers are great deal doers. Some lawyers are great litigators. Got to have both of them. We have a lawyer that's a transportation lawyer. So I had wanted to get a partnership and um, I met with Jerry Moyes at, at um, Swift. I met with Steve Aaron at Stevens Transport, Martin Transport, which was Randy Martin. And they all wanted to do the deal. Jerry Moyes came back to me and said, Mitch, what you want to do is too small of a scale of what I'm trying to do, but I like what, you, what you're putting together. And I said, oh, okay. I had had a deal papered all the way to the finish with Martin, with the Stevens Transport out of Dallas, and we were done. That deal was papered, we all agreed, and somebody died in their family. And when they died, they said, hey, give us two weeks while we go through this and let's get back together. Well, that time Randy Martin says, hey, can you fly up here to Mondovi, Wisconsin? I didn't know where Mondovi was. I flew to Mondovi, Wisconsin. We sat at the table that night and he said, let me tell you something. He said, I've checked everywhere with customers, people, everybody likes you. He said, and I'm just trying to find out, are you passionate about what you do or are you crazy? And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, anybody filed bankruptcy three times and still trying to do this business, you've lost your mind. And he said this, 
And it wasn't offensive to me. He said, you understand the transportation industry is a white man's business. He said, you understand that, right? He said, but the doors that I'm going to open for you and put you at the table are going to change your life. And I said, okay. So we sit there that whole night uh, and next day trying to do the deal. And it was like Shark Tank. We, you know, we came to a number because I already had a deal done. So I knew what I needed to improve in that deal. The biggest part of that deal was I did not at that time, because I had so much bitterness with the banks. I said, Randy, I don't want to deal with the banks. I said, Ken, uh, I said, part of my deal is I'm going to need a $2 million line of credit where I can make sure I pay carriers on time, pay employees on time and all that. He said, done. He said, all I want is a sweep account. So when those receivables come in that account, I can sweep and then pay you back. So we all make sure we're all protected. I said, fine. I said, also, uh, I walked around in the parking lot. He came out there to me and he says, hey, doesn't seem like you're happy with the equity that I'm going to give you. You've been, you've been, he wrote a check. He went to ACH. He said, I want you to write this check to you. So when you fly home, you got this check in your hand. And I said, yeah, Randy, I said, I'm, I'm happy with the deal. He said, let me tell you something. Learning from us as a public trading company, Sarbanes-Oxley, and all the stuff you're going to learn is priceless. Being in the meetings with us, understanding how to price your business, understanding how to make money, and understanding rating and all of that is priceless. You can't put a number on that. You don't understand what he was telling me until you go on in business with him for years. What I learned from that organization is priceless. So one thing I want to... Uh and we're running out of time to chime in and say, there, today we bought them back, what we did, and so we're 100% ourselves, now we we're always majority owners. Um, but what we do is we foster carrier relationships. So we have a major relationship with them because we can lean into that network. Our broker side of the business, they are still responsible for carrier development. So we have probably, I think, around 3,600 carriers there separate and apart from Martin Transport, and we have two other major relationships we're um, forging right now. Um, we got to have that baseline of trucks that we can have access to, to service our customers and to continue to grow. So it's really important um, to sum up a little bit what Mitchell said is to foster relationships in all aspects of the business, whether it's from a talent perspective, the bank perspective, other businesses that do what you do perspective, carrier perspective. It's really a lot of relationship management and delving into a good partnership with them so all can be successful together. Randy said one thing to me, when the deal is done, we signed it. He said, if either one of us have to go back and look at this document, we fail. And we never had to look back at that document. Give you an example why when you partner with the right people, how things can work for you. We touch, MW Logistics control 100% of all of Hidden Valley Ranch in this country. You go in a grocery store, we've touched it. You go in a, we touched it. So when we got that deal, I had to have 95 trailers, uh, two people on staff, and I had to have four, uh, 26 trucks and two Hostin trucks. I made one call, I called Randy, I said, hey, I got this deal, but here's what I need. I need 95 brand new trailers, I need this and that. He says, when you want to start? He went out, got 95 trailers, we put them in, we never looked back, we've been doing this for three, four years right now. That's a lot of time, Mitch. Okay. We so, got time for more questions. Y'all okay, keep it going. Good. We're good. Okay. We got a lot of questions out here, so I don't want. I, we I'm, feed the I'm, people here. We feed the people. Y'all, yeah. y'all got more questions or what? Yeah. All right. We we ain't gonna cut you out short. Come on, let's get it. Hey, my name's Bernard Holland with the HLH Logistics. First off, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Ward. I really enjoyed this segment. I have a twofold question. One, I know y'all mentioned y'all a three PL assetless company. And that's what I'm trying to become myself, more into it. And my questions really rely more on the bid. I know with your customers and your contracts and the different bids you look for, um, I believe that's a process with bidding and winning that work over. So the first question is like, what would be the best process when you're getting started looking for new customers, new clients? Like what would be the route of bidding? I know that's a lot of word of mouth for people who you know, but if there's different platforms or different sites you can go on to where these contracts are posted? Well, it depends on what you're talking about with private sector. I don't do any business with the government. I do all private sector business. But there's so many other customers. My wife has taught me this, being in the business two years. 
that are not the, the diva customers. How many people have ever heard of use Zoom Info? Yes, sir. Zoom Info used properly, you know, you have uh, a way to find out who's controlling those bids, who's uh, the transportation person, and you start calling. We, we put a half a million dollars uh, this year into inside sales. We hired our director of inside sales and we hired six people that do nothing but make 50 calls a day uh, trying to focus on finding those customers. You know, that's how we, if you look on Facebook, that's how we found the one we found uh, this week. And when you put that out there, you have to be generating revenue and finding customers every day. It can't be, you, you heard a, talk, a guy talk the other day, it just can't be me. Because then all I do is I got a high priced job. You have to build the infrastructure so that you have business coming in all the time. That's one way of doing it. The pricing part, we, when I looked at the publicly traded companies, the Martins, the Hunts, the people I got a relationship with, they got a whole pricing department. Why are they so good at pricing? Because they got the data and they're recycling through the data. So you have to have somebody that understands pricing, very good at pricing, and just really focus on that. And that's all they do. So you have to get your insights for the data for, for the bids, needless to say, just whatever resources you can attain, talking to others who haul it, trend data, things of that sort. Who was it? DAT, we use Sonar Freightways, um, things like that. Um, but back to the finding customers, I was talking to MJ, our son, um, yesterday, and he mentioned about a strategy. The Insight Sales Team had this internal thing now. Where can we go find customers outside of Zoom Info? And someone goes, you know what? They're about to start hauling a lot of pumpkins and Christmas trees. So they went online and Googled a list of all these companies, and they are just calling them now. And they got one or two supposed to call back next week, amazingly. There's so many lists out there on the Internet of different providers. So if you, you, know, you ride by, see a warehouse, that's a potential. You ride by, you see you know, a lot of trucks somewhere, look at where they're coming from. Um, but there's a lot of intel out there, even if you don't have access to those tools like Zoom Info and other things. We, also, when you deal with the Diva company, the big customers out there, the first thing they're going to ask you is, hey, have you filled out our, our website? Have you went in and, and put everything in the website to see, if, you know, so we, ha you we have an opportunity to use you. So we have a person, that's all they do, 50 companies uh, a week that he has to go do. Mm -hmm. And that's all he does. He gets a list of 1,000 customers, whether we know what they do, flatbed, whatever, and he'll fill out their DEI information to make sure we're registered with them. Then we keep that in our depository where we're, we know what we're, we're doing. So we meet them and say, yes, we are. But they're all gonna tell you, you need to be registered with me. You have to put yourself in a position to be found. There's somebody, no matter what business you do right now, sitting at a table and said, you know, we need to be found. I'm gonna tell a story that happened just uh, a couple of weeks ago, a friend I made at, a, at another company, he leaves that company, goes to another company. They're sitting in a meeting, and um, the Buffalo Bills are building a stadium, 2025. They made an uh, announcement that they want majority of the transportation done by DEI customers. Women-owned business, African-American-owned business, Hispanic-owned business, whether it's dump trucks, flatbeds, whatever. And so he was sitting in his room, as he told me with, with all my white guys, and they're going, well, God dang it, you know, how do we pull this off? And he looked at him and said, I got a guy, we can pull this off. And now we're talking about doing the stadium for the Buffalo Bills. Stretch out your network. Food shippers, if you are a transportation hauler, one of the best conferences there is. Look at food shippers, because every uh, VP, senior VP of transportation from Walmart to Target to Tyson Foods to all of them are going to be there. That's one of my favorite to go to. And it's a hell of a place to interview people too. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Bianca and I own a uh, carrier transportation company in LA and Long Beach doing dredge. Um, my question is more directed to your carrier side of business in your model. What do you guys look for when hiring on a carrier and becoming partners with them to run certain loads for you um, on, uh, on projects that you have ongoing? Because of the risk of hiring carriers, we took 100% of that out of our people's hand. We went to a, a system called My Carrier Packet. Probably heard of it. With My Carrier Packet, my wife and her team went through and said, these are criteria of all carriers you're going to have to have. When they go in the system, they automatically uh, put their information in the system. 
If you qualify to do business for us, it automatically qualifies you to do business. The risk out there in the marketplace today of hiring bad carriers is really tough. So we wanted to take that out of people's hand and make sure that we had a system in place. So if you fit the credentials in my carrier packet, then more likely uh, we're probably gonna use it. I think we use, and I could ask Victoria this year, uh, almost 50 some new carriers a week. We got new carriers that are calling us and, and want to do it that have qualified through my carrier packet. So my carrier packet is what we use. That way we can keep everybody out of it. We know the, the standard is the same standard for everybody that's coming in. Insurance, and, safety, all and, those things are all met. All met. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ms. Ward, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom in the trenches. It's been uh, really, really great to hear from you. Uh, my name is Aaron, uh, lead sales and marketing for a freight brokerage. We focus on open deck, specialized transport for multi-truck projects. Uh, we're based here in Texas. And uh, we have a floor team of about six people. And we feel like we've got a really strong core of individuals. My question, I'm curious to understand what you would say about structuring to scale in terms of what do these six people really need to focus on? Uh, I've heard, you know, the Chicago model versus the, you know, uh, uh, cradle to grave model in brokerage. So I was just curious to know how you would set up a, a brokerage to scale effectively um, if you're starting with six. One thing that we believe in, and we saw it, the change come again, I, I study a lot of what the big guys do. We don't do cradle to grave. Cradle to grave is really tough to do. We have the split model where we have brokers do nothing but broker. That's all they do is broker. They execute the freight. We have people who set the appointments, pick up deliveries, any changes or anything that goes on with that uh, shortage, they do all of that. So to scale, you, like, you, you have to go to somewhat of that split model. And sometimes what I find is I find good companies, they do what they do very well, but they can't get the big companies because they don't have EDI or they don't have all those capabilities. One of my uh, best agents that I found, he was doing about $300,000 a year. And I liked the guy and I told him, I said, man, you know, you got a great customer, but you can't scale. I said, if you look at becoming an agent for us, I bet you could scale. He does a million dollars a month right now from 300,000, a million dollars a month. Guess how many employees he has? He has him and one person that does his brokerage. I would add into that, that you should look at what they're doing, process. Where is there a natural break? Where is there a point where you said, you know, I could break this out to this person? Where can you segment it so they can be specialists? And once they have that down, you can scale to the next thing. It can't, usually doesn't happen all at once. You know when you've hit the wall or you, heard the, you hit the peak, and you're like, we have to do different. And then you evaluate those places in the process where then you start shifting to more of a split model where it makes sense. Thank you. That's, good. That's a good question. Hi, this is Natalie Leon. Um, I provide health healthcare solutions. I actually I was listening. You had three bankruptcy, right? Um, so my question <laughs> on that, I was thinking, I was like, how in the world did you convince the bank to loan you money after two bankruptcy, let alone a after one? That's, that's what I was saying when I, when I went into the partnership. What I knew was that I was going to get a lot of flack from the bank, and I didn't want that. So that's why I wanted the line of credit from my partner of $2 million until we became bankable to get our own line of credit. That's how I got through that. Because when they gave me that $2 million line of, uh, line of credit to pay carriers to do all that, everything else was history. But if I had to make that partnership and then go get a loan from a bank, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, thanks for the information. And as I hear you, you seem to be very methodical about numbers, uh, you talk about knowing Python and Power BI and all those types of things. Um, my, by the way, my name is Marcus Cooksey. I am a former owner operator and now solution provider for accounts payable, uh, accelerating payments for both brokers and factors and carriers in transportation through our AI. Now, the question I have to you is like, you know, most of us are in the growth phase of what we're trying to do. And it's like now you can hire people that, that know Python and Power BI. Are there any cheat codes to, you know, to help people to really know their numbers, their financials, to be able to go to a bank comfortably with confidence to then be able to get the funding that they need? Because that helps being able to have that long line of credit. Any, any secrets 
that uh, you've learned over the, over, the, over the years? I learned by being in the room with the publicly traded company, what people look at. I wasn't any smarter than anybody else. I just wanted to know what are the banks. I asked the banks, give me a list of what you're gonna be looking at. I have a list uh, that I have in my office that the bank gave me what regulates the bank and what they look at and what they have to qualify for a loan. What's the minimum, what's the, you know, that they're looking for. And I take those ratios and I'm always focused on those ratios to make sure we're in those ratios. When we went out to go and get our online uh, credit, we had four banks that were bidding for our business and it made the deal better. And dealing with the company that I dealt with, the, with Martin and still deal with today is, when I saw them get loans and they didn't have no covenants, I saw them get loans and they didn't have all this reporting, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I ain't never seen nothing like that. So we were very proud to say when we got our $4 million loan that we had no covenants on our loan because our financials were so strong and our receivables that we have are so good, you know, they pay. Uh, so those are, are big things. You have to understand, read all you can read. Anytime they have financial things, understand your balance sheet, understand your profit and loss, understand your ratios. Um, we, my wife wants us operating at an 88. Uh, we've operated at an 88, was it last year? Operated at an 88. Uh, this year we're probably gonna be a little in the 90s because the market has kind of changed on us but those operating ratios are very important. And what I would add to that is, um, there was some discussion at the dinner last night, but you need to expand your network to include people who've been there, done that. You know, if you have people that are just like you, you're gonna get exactly just like you. So make sure you expand that network of who you're not, that you're not doing that, but that, you know, what is your experience? What did you do in that segment? What, because some things are just across all business lines. Um, so especially when it comes to banking and financials and, you know, also who are their connections at banks? Request an informational sit down with them. They, they don't mind doing that with you. And at some point you're going to get comfortable with someone that knows you and that will help you along the way. If you're factoring, because a lot of companies are smaller, you are factoring. Understand how much you're paying the factor every month. When you look at that, you, when you're trying to get that line of credit and you're trying to deal with a bank, you tell the bank, look, I'm paying these guys $30,000 a month. If I can just get help from you, because you see my receivables are paying, you're gonna have a, my receivables that you're, you're really counting on. If I can cut that down to five, to 10, to 15, that's more money to my bottom line, so I should be able to pay you. A lot of people won't explain it like that, but if you're factoring, you're paying a fee. What is that fee you're paying them a year, whatever? Tell that to the banker. Man, I'm paying $200,000, $300,000 over here to the factory. How can I get a, a line of credit where I only pay 100,000? 150,000 and get them engaged in the business and have them talk to you, find that relationship and continue to talk when they say, okay, you know what? We can bank you now. Thank you. Uh, yes, good afternoon. So once again, I'd like to thank you for your time, your insight, your expertise. I'm sure everyone here really finds a lot of value in that. I had a question in line with the discussion around talent acquisition and retention. And I'm curious in regards to the different scorecards, the matrix, the testing that you do, have you ever discovered that there are individuals who have more talent or experience or could be more successful in different roles in the role that they may be in and you actually recommend to shift them into those roles that would add to the ability and the probability of not only them being successful, but the company also growing and being successful as well. True, true, true. true. I'm answer, I'm <laughs> All the way around. Question. We have a growth tree in our organization. And in that growth tree, you see where you come in and you see what your next promotion is going to be. Promote within. If you don't promote within, people get kind of, eh, they get kind of upset. The only where we really hadn't really promoted within is when you start to get next to that VP level. You know, you might not have somebody who they think they can be a VP, but they don't have the experience and behind the numbers and the stuff of, of, of understanding what it takes to be a VP in an organization. But promote within and have a growth tree of, you're gonna come in and you're gonna start scheduling. We have two interns right now that um, we have on the floor that we're probably gonna hire once they graduate from school, but they've been with us. Uh, well, that's the plan. We, we started an internship yeah. program to promote from within, but to your question, um, you should always be open to people transferring their skill sets because I always, you know, I had an executive coach once upon a time. She was, if you're doing, you know, what got you there, it's not going to keep you there. You've got to always expand your skills and people don't want to do always do the same thing. So once they have truly proven they can do the role um, and that they're a great performer, they're a team player, they're all the things you want them to be, you do want to retain them. And so shifting them is a natural progression that everyone should embrace. 
Good yes, afternoon. Ma'am. <laughs> My name is Shaylin Dixon. Is that Philadelphia? Yes. Hey. Oh, Lord. <laughs> afternoon. Um, so as a freight brokerage owner, um, when you first started, right, or not a logistics provider, when your customers are working with you in the beginning, they really enjoy working with you. You have a relationship with them. One of the biggest challenges is as you start to scale, your customers don't want to work with anyone else in your organization. How do you overcome that? That's my biggest struggle right now. I think it's, a, uh, I, let me do that because I had to shift some people like that too. Um, you just have to have an honest conversation with your customer. You, a, the customer doesn't want to hold an employee back and they can't keep that. They go someplace else. It's just this is how your organization is going. But typically, like in a sales organization, you partner somebody along the way. They're meeting that person instead of cutting them off cold turkey. They meet Pam and Mitch now. And so, you know, there's a period of time where they're getting comfortable with Pam and Mitch. Pam's new. Now, all of a sudden, okay, Pam's taking this call. All of a sudden, Pam's taking the call. And they're like, now it's Pam. You know, you can shift it on them also. So it kind of depends on your relationship with the customer. You can ease them into it. and They don't even know what happened to them. Or you can just say, hey, this is just how it has to be for us to continue to excel and let them know you'll be right there with that new person every step of the way. They, they uh, with your customers, I'm so close to, when I say I have a, a call list that I do every other week, and I have certain people at every company that I'm gonna call every other week. I just, I'm gonna make that happen. I'll, even if it's a two second call, if they don't answer, I leave a message, you know, I know their kid's name, hey man, how's your kid name? I heard your kid have a baseball game. I stay in contact with them all the time. I call them and say, hey, I know you're probably going to have some problems this week. Think about us, because we can cover those problems if you have some problems this week. One of my favorite things this week, we had a customer that had to get 23 roads uh, to Costco in the next three weeks. And they called me and said, Mitch, can you get it done? And see, when you bring that value to them, they don't talk about price. They talk about, hey, helping me out. I like that. I like that. You know, I always say, if, you, if you're on side of the road, and you have a flat, and it's raining or whatever, and the guy comes and says, I'm going to change your flat for $100. And then a man, you're going to jump in the car and get your wife, I ain't paying him no $100. Your wife's going to say, you better get out there and pay him $100. You know, so we can get off the side of the road. So the value of them really knowing you and understanding who you are and always meeting with them is very important. Now, will they shift off? You shift off and you do that. I had an email that came back after this project we've done with Costco. Uh, the guy that handled that was named Michael in our office and they said, they emailed and they wanted to put me on and said, hey, Michael, we just want to let you know, you did a great job. And I emailed back to all of them and said, hey, Michael, he wasn't talking to you, they meant to say Mitchell, it's kind of close to the same name, but thank you, Michael, for what you did too. And they laugh and they call me, you just, you just too much. But you have to have those relationships with those customers to make you. sure, but you have to let them know, for me to grow and be successful, I need to add this person handling, the, like the account manager and whatever handling that account. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. We got to bring this to a close to keep it going. Listen, make the room safe. Give it up for Pamela Ward, Mitchell Ward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.